So now we get into the next aspect of this battle for integration. And it sort of talks back to the wise. Because the more you look at the way the world is and how hard things are, and the endless struggle, and you realize, you know what, that's eternity too. One great big process of endless battle with the promise being that you'll love it. And if you already love fighting, well, then you can relate to that. If you don't, like I don't, it's a hard sell. But once you realize that that's got to be the right answer, because he's always God and we're always not, then it has to be true as a why, in addition to the first why of truth be free. It has to be true that God loves the battle. He's got to love it. Or it wouldn't exist. Now this is really one of the other things that really flips Satan because he's looking at the same facts he sees more facts than I do but I see enough and he's saying what the and this is really what's going on in Satan's mind this is why he doesn't quit what the why would God create a situation where there's endless struggle and even on top of that Satan's like Endless struggle in your own nature, what you are, you're never going to be God. It's never really going to end. And if anything, you have to argue that the struggle in eternity is higher and harder. Because you're bigger. Okay. The funny thing about being bigger is it gets worse. See, when you're a kid, when you're little, everything's easy. When you're an adult, everything's hard. Why? Because you're bigger. So what do you think bigger is going to be like in the eternal state? Worse. So God is the biggest. So the struggle for him has to be the worst. So what gives? What the f... Okay? Satan's just looking at all this and saying, Something's wrong here. He's God. He doesn't have to work at anything. So why did he create unending struggle for himself? Now there's only one logical answer to that question. He loves it. It's not like Satan doesn't know that answer. If I know it, he knows it. If he didn't know it, he knows it now. But the bigger question behind that is, how can you love it? And in that particular question, I'm right there with Satan, baby. You know? I, I, I totally understand where he's coming from when he, when he objects to this. And you say, well, where is that brain out? Well, it's in several places. You got Job 1, Job 2, Isaiah 4, 14, Ezekiel 28, but most prominently in Matthew 4. First, second, and third temptations all reflect this mindset. He's just absolutely flummoxed that Christ would make it hard on himself, that Father would make it hard on Christ because he admires Christ. He more than any other creature on this planet or in the universe understood exactly how hard it would be because he knew Christ as God to see him be human and not cheat and not play games with his own deity just flummoxed him and how do you know that? because of the kind of temptations that he levies 
The first temptation is a power of suggestion. Try to bypass the Lord's will and go th- right through his subconscious, as my pastor liked to put it. Speak these stones in the bread, because the human nature would immediately, should have immediately, imagined bread. And since he's really God, not just human, that would have turned the stones into bread. Just to imagine doing the command. Just to imagine it. Because that's the power of God. He thinks a thing and it is. He speaks a thing and it is. When you're speaking, you're thinking, ideally. Okay? That's what Satan was trying to do, is to use the subconscious of the human to tap the deity, to get the stones turned into bread. Okay, and I covered that already in the battle of integration and also, you know, the whole sequencing thing. Okay, well... Christ was so good at it that when the word bread came up he thought of a Bible verse rather than bread. And I already told you that, you know, Deuteronomy 8.3. Okay, so here we go. Satan's all like, how can you love this? So that's what it is. That's why it is. That's why this battle of integration goes. That's why God designed it this way, to maximize the throwdown. You know, prostrate, throwing yourself prostrate, throwing yourself down in worship. He's worshiping the truth that he actually created. And you see that in Psalm 138 too. Putting the truth above his own name. That's worship. And it's a worship of two kinds. One, truth be free. And second, how do you want to say it? Truth be struggle. Those are two basic characteristics of truth. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it's true across the board. And it kind of cracks me up because you got all these atheists saying science, 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 science. And everything in science absolutely reflects that design philosophy. It's a philosophy. Union of opposites. Hello, hypostatic union. Union of opposites is key to everything in physics. It's key to everything in math. It's key to everything in biology. Every single moment you breathe, The law of opposites is operating in your life, or you couldn't keep on breathing. Inhale, exhale, those are opposites. Life depends on death, death depends on life, those are opposites. Action and reaction, those are opposites. High, low, those are opposites. Do you remember the Bible verses like valley made high and mountain made low? Matter and energy, those are opposites. How is it? that the scientists don't see the face of God every time they look at their scientific so-called laws. Entropy? Yeah. Anything that's not God is subject to entropy. Duh. The universe has a beginning, therefore. Because you can't have a law of entropy and a universe that just always was. If the universe just always was, there'd be no entropy. So all these so-called scientists who call themselves rational, but somehow believing in God is not rational, they're the ones who are stupid. They don't even know their own science. Because science reflects the philosophy of God, especially with respect to truth be free and Truth be law of opposites. Struggle. Everything. Everything in life. Just just pick anything you want. And then just go look for the law of the opposites. Male, female. 
up down left side right side live dead black white it's just hysterical democrat republican stupid smart See, and you say, oh, but there's all, there are lots of variations in between. Yeah, that's called truth be free, the full spectrum. God's definition of perfection is not mine. God's definition of perfection is that everything be included from all the high and all the low and it all be connected and it all have a purpose, a fit, a place, a, a, what do you want to call it, a reason for existence. And that has to be a design philosophy. A mindless nature would not go out of its way to create meaning for a speck of dust. Of course, a mindless nature wouldn't create anything because a mindless nature would be incapable of creating. You realize, don't you? DNA is just a bunch of organic computer programs. Where did the computer programs come from, Mommy? DNA is an instruction set. Instruction set. Okay, so who's the instructor? Duh! Now, in this therefore battle of integration to me the most disheartening thing but it's not supposed to be is that it never ends the game is the process you got little wins along the way but it's all about the process and God absolutely totally loves the process it doesn't have to have a beginning it doesn't have to have a middle it doesn't have to have an ending just like he doesn't process always occurring that's omniscience and people always say well how can how can God be infinite and have an infinite omniscience because the next, they're thinking in terms of the next moment, the next moment, the next moment are never ending in occurrence. They don't realize that God is outside time. That to God, think of a sheet of paper again. And a bunch of dots are just dotting up the page. As if somebody were taking a, a pencil and just hitting the page with dots. All over the place with dots. That's time. If you're looking at the whole page, then you're seeing all the dots at once. Okay? All of them. So time is not partial to you. If you're God. If you're not God, well, you can't see the other dots. So the dots that haven't occurred yet, God already sees. The dots that have occurred already, of course, he sees. The dots that occurred in the past are still alive. And, you know, the closest analogy would be a Georges Surat painting, Sunday Afternoon in the Park is the title of it. And if you get up real close, you can see the... That's how he painted it. If you stand back, it looks like a regular painting. Very interesting artwork. God's standing back looking at the painting of time. And to us, like, as it were, you know, there was this old game back when I was a kid called Fascination. And it was a bunch of lights, light bulbs little tiny light bulbs inside a uh, sort of like plastic board game 
and you I forget if you rolled the dice or you hit something and the lights would light up okay so think of a sheet of paper again with that diagonal line again and all the little dots along that diagonal line they light up not all at once maybe in a sequence starting in the lower left moving up toward the upper right that's the line of time if you're on the line of time you don't remember what went before and you don't know where you're going if you're looking at it full on as a whole sheet of paper you see all the dots before they occur excuse me when they occur and after they occur so god the whole story the whole story is playing out. I'll finish this in a minute. I got the hiccups.